If you're focusing on that, then, yeah. then you can turn it on. Okay. Yeah. So it's recording. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, Dr. Chris Dolan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Baines. Um, and, and thanks to all of you. Uh, I know Galina has heard a lot of this talk because I, I, I'm basically building on the same talk that I gave about a week ago. So if you heard that one, bear with it again, and then I hope it will you know, bring, bring in some questions that maybe we didn't have a chance to discuss last week. Um, <clears throat> I have tried to make it a bit shorter. <laughs> it was a bit uh, too long for this class. Um, and there, there's a reason why I, I kept it, basically, because I think it's, it's a, a presentation which tries to to look both at the, the stated topic of investigating crimes of sexual violence, conflict-related sexual violence against men, but it's also um, trying to give some kind of a sense of what is the broader issue of sexual violence against men in conflict, and at the same time to tell a bit of a story about the advocacy work that we have done on the issue. Um, you know, much, much though I did a PhD and everything, I've always been a great believer that if you're doing research in the social sciences, ideally it has some kind of relationship with processes that you're documenting. And so, you know, that, that has been a <coughs> very much part of the way in which I've, I've always tried to work, sometimes more successfully, sometimes less successfully. But uh, in terms of the why focus on investigation, it's really a discussion which is coming at a particular moment in the development of policy around sexual violence in conflict. And one example of that is UN women supporting the development of a whole cadre of investigators in different parts of the globe that they hope they will be able to parachute in at any given moment to places like Syria, or Libya a few years ago, uh, to investigate crimes before the trail goes completely cold. And I was trained, I, I'm one of that cadre, I've never been sent anywhere, that's why I'm saying I don't get sent anywhere, but I, I have been trained. Um, when I was trained, there was absolutely nothing in a one-week training course about sexual violence against men. It was all about women and girls, and occasionally about women and children. UN Women is not the only people doing this. You have the British government coming up with a big, massive, actually, uh, program called the Prevention of Sexual Violence Initiative, um, which, as part of its process, is developing what they call an international investigations protocol um, and again, they're also building up a cadre of investigators. They're hoping to get sign up to this protocol at a big conference in June this year. So just about three months down the road, there will be this protocol. I know because my colleagues were in a workshop in the British Embassy held by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office just on Tuesday, so two days ago that it's not going to be a particularly, I'm not very confident that it will be a great protocol because they're really rushing the process in order to have it ready for this summit. So it's all a bit back to front. Nonetheless, it is, it's part of this bigger discussion. Um, and just in the last few weeks, the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, so the kind of flagship institution for international criminal law and criminal justice, has started developing its own policy on sexual and gender-based crimes. And obviously, their prosecutors, they, they, there's a whole raft of investigations attached to any prosecution. So there, although the policy which I'm referring to doesn't talk much about investigations per se, but it is the backdrop, and it's a kind of internal document which hopefully is going to set the tone for what they actually do in the field. Um, so that's just happened, or is happening. The final document is not yet done because they, they asked for inputs and we and others gave inputs. We shall see you know, whether they take any notice whatsoever 
of what we've suggested. In terms of how I talk today, I'm not going to focus so much on the technical challenges of investigation, so much as the larger political and systemic dimensions and the conceptual challenges which prevent us from actually reaching the technical discussion. So, you know, when I say the technical discussion, when you go to a training to become one of this magic carder, you will start getting into discussions about what are the elements of crimes, you know, what do you have to prove through interviewing witnesses constitutes a war crime, for example. So it's a, it's a very interesting technical discussion. But when we look at crimes against men and boys, we're not even getting to that technical discussion in many respects because of these larger political and systemic challenges. Having said that, much as we're not getting to it yet, or we haven't got very far, I'm not saying we, nothing has happened ever, things have happened, um, but it seems that with these different policy discussions and processes going on, it's a bit of a pivotal moment. I don't mean a three second moment, but you know, the next couple of years, I think, are going to take us in one of two possible directions. And one is that we're going to see investigations continuing with a, a relatively narrow understanding of gender, which actually ends up policing the existing gender order. Alternatively, instead of it being a, you know, a tool of global policing, it might become an instrument of a much more universal sense of individual and social justice. Which of those two directions we take, I think, you know, there are a number of challenges which are going to determine whether we go in one to the, to the left or the right, or the right or the left, I'm not saying politically left or right, in terms of my diagram. And I've tried to capture these under just two big headings. The first is invisibility. Conflict-related sexual violence against men has been rendered invisible or hidden in plain sight. So this particular picture is one of our clients. This was a picture taken in 2011. And you will see there are various quite strange lines in the x-ray. This is of his pelvic area. And those lines are where he was raped with a screwdriver. So he's still, you can still read it in his body, even in this x-ray. And the invisibility, I mean, it's also a very interesting image. It was taken as part of a series of photographs that went into a photo essay <coughs> for the, the Guardian, or the Independent. And um, at that point in 2011, none of our clients felt comfortable to have his face revealed. So these different photos in this photo essay, in one way or another, they kind of tell you the reality of the issue. But at the same time, they don't, they don't give away the face of the person concerned. And when I say hidden in place, this is a, a police report which talks about you know, a medical case for both the husband and wife were sexually abused. So in certain spaces, even within the kind of bureaucratic paper crunching processes that you were referring to, these incidents are being captured, but they never seem to make it off this piece of paper into a computerized database and into then the national statistics. So when you go to northern Uganda, for example, um, and you try to get statistics on sexual violence as a whole, Nearly all the statistics refer to women and girls. And just a tiny, tiny percentage refer to men or boys. You know, something like 99% one side and 1% the other, literally. So this kind of stuff never seems to somehow translate into figures that would then prompt us to think differently about what's actually going on, or the, the pattern. So I said the, one of the biggest challenges is invisibility, the other is silencing. This is one of our clients who uh, was a victim of gang rapes on about four different occasions in Kampala. So in his country of asylum, the guy is from Congo, 
but he was he's a good looking guy or he was before he got completely traumatized and somebody obviously developed some kind of an obsession with him and mobilized friends of his and they tracked him on several different occasions in several different places and abducted him and when he refused to engage consensually in sexual activities they raped him and not on one occasion, on several different occasions. So I want to talk a bit about the, <coughs> the silencing and how such a big issue and I will give you some figures later why I can say confidently it's a big issue, not a 1% issue, a big issue. How does it become invisible? This is unfortunately the level of, <laughs> it's a very much expanded picture, that's why it's so pixelated. But it is a picture um, suggesting that this guy, he's bending over, there's a lot of the language that people use actually in northern Uganda is you know, to, to bend over in a way which is difficult. So the guy is bending over, the guy with the, uh, he's actually holding an AK-47 or something, but it kind of is also suggestive that he's about to rape him. Um, but anyway, so that's the picture, but how does it become invisible? And essentially, it's a whole series of myths that make it very difficult for us to hear and to realize what we're seeing in front of us. One of them is that men cannot be raped. That's probably the biggest of them. The number of times in which I have run a workshop with service providers and said, you know, we want to talk about sexual violence and we talk about sexual violence against women and, say, and, well, and we also want to talk about men. And someone invariably puts their hand out and says, but a man can't be raped. And they believe it, they really believe it. They're not just trying to be difficult. Real men can defend themselves against rape. These are gender norms, right? A real man. The male victim becomes a homosexual. Only gay men are victims or perpetrators. Gays and bisexuals, they deserve to be raped anyway. And then others say male rape only happens in prison. And if you're in prison, you deserve to be raped anyway. A woman cannot sexually assault a man. A man whose body responds to rape, for example, if he gets an erection, he must have wanted it. Men are not affected by rape, or not as much as women, because after all, re they're real men, right? Real men, don't, they don't feel the pain, they can resist. A man who's been raped becomes a woman. This one is a transition point. All of these up to this point are rape myths that were documented in a, in a review of the American academic literature on male rape myths. So these are all male rape myths that come from the US or that are present in the US. But they're all exactly the same as the ones that we hear in Uganda. Exactly the same. Perhaps not this one so much but all the others. But at this transition point, the light blue one or grey, a man who has been raped becomes a woman. This is where I'm bringing in the myths, the additional myths that we hear in, in Uganda. So that speaks to all these kind of perceptions that, you know, one, as soon as you're penetrated, you're feminized, therefore you become a woman. And I've, I've had clients I did an interview last September with a guy who said, I am a woman. You know, and he was this really, really desperately miserable looking individual who was clearly a man, biologically, but he felt like I'm a woman. And he'd completely internalized all of this stuff. So the, the myths are not just put out there by those who are not victims. Like people, just like any other form of stigmatization, people internalize it. A man who has been raped cannot father children. So this is, you know, this is a very disturbing myth. 
for the vast majority of men who do want to father children and who live in societies where having a lot of children is the primary indicator that you've made it as an adult male. Another myth, the only form of sexual violence against men is anal rape. This is a myth that I'm now, I'm kind of summarizing lots of different messages that I've heard in lots of different discussions in different spaces. Completely untrue, and later I will give you a list of other forms of sexual violence that, that we've generated from our interviews with, with male survivors. The ones in blue, I'm coming to the blue ones, they're the top of the pile, they're the top of the institutional chain. This is, these are myths from the UN that I've seen reflected again and again. Not so much in formal policy, but in practice in the way that they talk about cases. Any refugee who claims he's been raped is just looking for resettlement. So it's just another lie. The default mode of organizations like UNHCR in the field is, and you know, to a certain extent, they have to be skeptical because people do tell a lot of stories. But it, it kind of becomes then the default mode that you don't believe anything that anybody tells you, and they have to do an enormous amount of work to convince the officials that what they say happened actually did happen. And it's not just UNHCR. I could talk at length about immigration officials who have exactly the same tendency. But UNHCR people will definitely say. It's just looking for resettlement. So immediately, if you try to imagine presenting your case, and there's just this look of complete disbelief and skepticism, and you're telling it because you really you feel you have to tell it, but at the same time it's the most difficult thing you've ever told anyone, you, know, you, you end up getting very confused, and further, it's a further traumatization, to be honest. This is a myth more in kind of policy circles, not, not in terms of people on the ground working with refugees, but levels of rape of men are so low as not to warrant attention. This you will find a lot um, in a lot of the NGOs that are working on sexual and gender-based violence against women. Furthermore, to make it even more complicated, they'll say it's not a gender-based crime. So in the Interagency Standing Committee at the moment, which is kind of supposedly the overarching, one of the overarching bodies that is developing policy for humanitarian assistance, there's a whole, uh, a clique, if you like, of organizations and their representatives that are pushing this argument that it's not a gender-based crime. So we should not include a discussion of sexual violence against men in conflict in our G, so called GBV prevention and response discussions. And just to give you an example of what that means, there is a document which I largely prepared for UNHCR, uh, just a guidance note on working with, with men and boy survivors. And it was put up on the GBV protection, on the, the Global Protection Cluster website but it was not put up under GBV. It was put up under diversity. And diversity in the UN code, code, in the UN system is kind of code for sexual and gender minorities. So just by where they placed it, they had elided sexual violence against men with LGBTI issues, which is a very popular part of the male rape myths. This one. Only gay men are victims or perpetrators. Or this one, they turn into homosexuals. So you can see how these, these myths and the processes feed each other. And this one, just to throw in, a man who rapes a woman cannot be a victim. So this is a huge myth, which merits a whole other discussion. But it's a, you know, and at heart, it's a myth related to the way in which legal processes are structured and in which legal processes demand the good guy and the bad guy. 
the perpetrator and the victim and the winner and the loser um, so a man who rapes a woman cannot be a victim well actually he can depending on what circumstances he did that act which for the woman would clearly be understood rightly so as a rape but for him could very well be a highly coerced action which he had absolutely no intention of doing and absolutely no pleasure in doing or no satisfaction well, pleasure, what pleasure, what satisfaction, where is it about power, where is it about sexual pleasure that's another discussion, we could have another class but the point is that you can be coerced and it's very clear from the many people that we've talked to that not all, but many men are able to get sufficiently, a, sufficiently, a, a sufficient erection, if you like, to, to be able to, to go through a sexual act. But it's not one from which they derive anything that they would want to derive. They just end up almost terminally, terminally traumatized. So, the male rape myth. And it looks like a novel title, but actually these are very, very prevalent all over the place. As I say, they come from, you find the same ones on all different corners of the globe. And they kind of intersect in that sort of rather painful way and you can't quite see necessarily how they, how they intersect. But <clears throat> for the sake of trying to be reasonably brief, I'm going to look at just a few examples of places where these myths are officially legitimized or legitimated and institutionalized. So my choice of language is quite careful. Legitimated, that's around the, more the legal frameworks and stuff. And institutionalized is around the institutions that are in part actually generating some of these myths. Um, in the presentation I gave the other day, I talked initially, I, talked, I started with popular culture. In the interest of time, I've cut that bit out, but we can talk about it later if there's time, because I personally think it's quite fascinating. The training, or the lack of training rather, for key professional groups, medical workers, social workers, counsellors, lawyers, you know, that's part of what keeps, what leaves these myths unchallenged. But uh, the big three that I want to talk about are the legal frameworks, transitional and criminal justice, and the international institutions, and the women, peace, and security architecture. Starting with the legal frameworks, there are many places where the legal, the law defines rape as something perpetrated by men against women. Uganda is a great example from the penal code. Article 1, 2, 3, the definition of rape, any person who has unlawful carnal knowledge of a woman or girl without her consent or with her consent if the consent is obtained by force or by means of threats or intimidation of any kind or by fear of bodily harm or by means of a blah 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 commits the felony termed rape. So that's Uganda. In America, the U.S. Military Uniform Code of Justice, which was first drawn up in 1949, is just as one-sided. Rape is any person subject to this code who commits an act of sexual intercourse with a female, not his wife, by force and without her consent, is guilty of rape. Penetration, however slight, is sufficient to complete the offense. And later on, there's a 2008 edition which spells out exactly what penetration, however slight, might mean. For rape to occur, there must be contact between the penis and vulva or penetration of the genital opening. So again, I'm just, you know, these are laws from two very diverse places, but they both have only one half of the gender binary can be vulnerable to rape. It's not just... Uh, these countries where they, I mean, 1949, the penal code was a bit, was a British colonial invention. But just as recent as 2006, protocol on the prevention and suppression, I don't like the word suppression, we could discuss that later, but the suppression of sexual violence against women and children, 
also excluded men from the definition of rape. So the Great Lakes region of Africa, not Canada. And it's, what's interesting about this is that there was a huge discussion about whether it should be women and girls, women and children, women, men, girls and boys. And the compromise was, and the, the basically the, the, the opponents of including men and boys were Unifem. This is the Unifem logo, apparently. Little dove of peace, I guess. Women as peace builders. You've got the women's symbol and the peace. Anyway, Unifem blocked the inclusion of men. And they wanted to block the inclusion of boys, but they had to compromise with women and children. So that's what the Great Lakes Protocol currently has. So you really have to think, like, where is this coming from? It's easy to look at a penal code like Uganda and say, oh, you know, they're just not really up with the trends and they're, they're backwards and they haven't caught up and da da da. Not true. This is coming from somewhere quite different. So you have that, that's one part of the legal, the big legal the problem with the legal frameworks. The other part is the criminalization of same sex conduct. It still goes back in many places to the penal codes, which were put in place by the British, um, which defines uh, uh, same-sex sexual acts as unnatural offences. Any person who has carnal knowledge of any person against the order of nature. So the order of nature, you can all imagine what that is, and against it, you can probably imagine what that is. Uh, anyway, this is Uganda. But again, I would just caution that we don't get into thinking, oh, you know, they just haven't caught up. Permit is a very interesting word, because you don't know whether it means, does that mean he didn't give his consent? Or does it mean he wasn't enough of a man to, to put up enough of a fight? So there's a complete failure to distinguish you can't use this to distinguish between consensual and non-consensual. So basically, you can be judged to have permitted it to happen and therefore be criminalized, if you are, even if you're raped. You can't be raped in Uganda as a man. That's basically the point. But the language tells you why you can't be raped. What I was saying about, you know, let's, let's not forget the British influence on this. British Empire at its worst, the, all the colors in red, including Canada, that was the British Empire at its worst. When you look at where the majority of countries that where same-sex sexuality is still criminalized today, it's pretty much, it overlays almost exactly. And then there are some other countries where it's also criminalized. But, you know, you go from the British Empire to current patterns. I mean, these have changed, Australia and North America, but much of the rest of it hasn't. Even in North America, as of 2014, um, you know, it's 10 years since there was a ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court, something called Lawrence versus Texas, which struck down anti-sodomy laws across the country. But ten years, more than 10 years later, 17 states actually have done nothing to revise their laws in accordance with that ruling. So again, we shouldn't assume that this is, you know, this is a Ugandan or an African problem. It's right in, in the North American heartlands, very much a problem as well. Moving on from legal frameworks, the issue of Post-conflict, transitional justice, there's a, love, a number of people here that are interested in transitional justice, we can talk about this more. And criminal justice, you know, is, transitional, is criminal justice part of transitional justice? That's another discussion. Um, but the international criminal justice process, um, which either do not address or name, or which re-characterize sexual violence against men. And 
what we call like an emblematic case is in uh, the, the trial of Kenyatta following the post-election violence in Kenya in 2007, during which large numbers of men were raped and others were castrated or otherwise ge suffered genital mutilation. And uh, the office of the prosecutor tried to get that charged as sexual violence, you know, other forms of sexual violence. It's not rape, it's not slavery, it's not enforced prostitution, it's another form of sexual violence. But then the pre-trial chamber decided that not every act of violence which targets parts of the body commonly associated with sexuality should be considered an act of sexual violence. So they categorized castration as other inhumane acts. Which is, you know, is quite a loss. You've not just lost your genitalia, but you've also been told that your genitalia don't even matter from a sexual point of view. You know, it's just it, it, a very painful ruling, I think. Anyway, it's being challenged, and it's not clear that they're actually going to go through with it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it kind of back up. I mean, it's just in the sentence, like, it seems so paradoxical. It doesn't make any sense. Well, you know, they uh, brought that, like, how did that or? I haven't read that judgment. I just know that that's what the, the conclusion they came to. So it's a, it's a good question, but I, I have to admit I haven't read the judgment. But um, one of the things that we're trying to do now is to look back at, you know, having seen this one, to look back at some of the other judgments from the ICTY, International Criminal Tribunal, of uh, Yugoslavia, and the one for Rwanda. Look back at those judgments and find cases where they've used other inhumane acts and see whether actually there are things like this stuck in there. You know, to see whether what we've, what's been happening in the past is you've had all these criminal procedures and sexual violence against men has been put on the table, but it's sort of disappeared under these catch-all phrases. That's one of the things we're looking at right now. Turning to the inter international institutions. This, is, this comes from... Um, an article, I don't know if you can read it, but an article by uh, Luis Moreno Ocampo. Those of you who are into international criminal justice will know that he was the first prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. One of my least favorite people, I've never met him, but I just can't. <laughs> you know, in terms of what I, I, I think largely the mess he made of the ICC in its first 10 years, I think has been something of a disaster. Nonetheless, at least he tried to charge Kenyatta with other forms of sexual violence. But in an article that he wrote about the whole issue of investigating sexual and gender-based crimes, he pointed out that um, even the 1971, uh, 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women did not discuss sexual violence. And they brought it in in a recommendation as late as 1992, um, which in a recommendation which said the definition of discrimination now includes gender-based violence. That is violence that is directed against a woman because she's a woman or that affects women disproportionately. <clears throat> so what's interesting about this is the fact that in 1992, this kind of thinking that gender-based violence is about women is kind of clearly, very clearly stated. That then later on translates into what is described as the women, peace and security architecture. And the starting point, you know, generally this is seen as starting with UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which was made in the year 2000 and which called on all parties <coughs> to armed conflicts to take special measures to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, particularly rape and other forms of sexual abuse and all other forms of violence in situations of armed conflict. So, women and girls. There were then a number of different resolutions within that women, peace and security framework. 
but it went on from that was from 2000, 2000 2008 resolution 1820 restates that women and girls are particularly targeted by the use of sexual violence including as a tactic of war to humiliate but then it starts to bring in it somehow morphs a little in the course of the next few paragraphs and recalling its condemnation in the strongest terms of all sexual and other forms of violence committed against civilians in armed conflict, in particular women and children. So you start to see that, that shift from girls to children, but as yet no men. And it continues all the way up to last June. And in June 2013, we had Security Council Resolution 2106, which while still arguing that sexual violence in armed conflict and post-conflict situations disproportionately affects women and girls and severely impedes the contribution of women to society, finally acknowledges, a little hesitantly, but it does, it does acknowledge that it also affects men and boys and those secondarily traumatized as forced witnesses of sexual violence against family members. So they're here, sort of. But only since last year. So I hope you're beginning to see like why I say we seem to be in something of a policy moment, you know, a, a pivotal moment in policy making. It's, something is shifting, but you can also see how tentative the language of that is. I mean, it's not exactly a strong it's not a strong line. There was actually a, a declaration by the foreign ministers of the G8 a couple of months before this, which said that all victims of sexual violence, be they women, men, girls or boys, deserve and are entitled to assistance. So the, that declaration was actually much more strongly worded than this resolution. But the resolution has greater weight because it's the UN Security Council. So that's why I've, I've, I've talked about this one. And as I already mentioned, you know, getting from this, which tentative though it is, is a massive change from the year 2000, getting from this to a place where we have policy documents and procedures and practices and trainings that bring men and boys fully into the picture is still a long way to go. And you know, I, 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 when I was researching this last year in preparation for a workshop, I did actually follow a GBV emergency response training course online organized by UNFPA. And it took me a whole day and there wasn't a single reference to sexual violence against men or boys. In a whole day. I started at nine, I finished at six and I got my certificate, but it doesn't say anything about men and boys at all. There's not even a picture of a male body. So, you know, I don't know whether they've rectified it yet. I'm hoping that somebody told them I said this, but <laughs> I doubt that they've rectified it. It will probably take some very expensive consultants to do that work. And I mean, the reality, and we also have to be careful, I'm very aware of this in terms of advocating for the inclusion of men, advocating for, particularly for men, there's a discussion there, is it men or men and boys, but advocating for the inclusion of men, probably and boys as well, that in breaking one silence we create or reinforce another one. And again, this is where I think the institutional thing is really interesting, you and women, for those of you who are familiar with the UN, you'll know that UN women didn't exist until 2010. And you really have to ask yourself, why on earth did they call it UN women? Why didn't they call it ungender? Because then the name would have actually had a really much more interesting social justice purpose, which is to deconstruct gender norms, gender binaries, Instead, what they've done is to institutionalize one half of a very conservative male-female gender binary. And they've institutionalized it, they've given it a name, and we'll probably be stuck with it for the next 50 years. <laughs>
and they will do a lot of damage in the next 50 years and some good but the fact is they've really gone a rather conservative route they could easily have called it UN gender I'm very sure they could have done that but they were not thinking big they were thinking about a particular subgroup so they were basically you know they were still stuck on the idea we have to break the silence about sexual and gender based violence against women and male female inequality in patriarchal systems all of which I, I think is totally legitimate but for a UN body it's, it's not enough Anyway, but that's what we have. So we should start a campaign to rename it. But then we'd have to do some... What's that TJ process called where you... It's like the fifth column of TJ. The institutional cleansing. <laughs> yeah, there's a word for it. Come on, you TJ expert. Vetting? Lustration. Lustration, yes, we might have to do some serious lustration of UN women <laughs> before we get to UN gender. But anyway, that's another discussion. Okay, this was about the big framework stuff. I want to look much more from a sort of bottom up perspective <coughs> uh, how the impacts of sexual violence against men, the impacts on the individuals and those around them, reinforce and cement the silence which the institutions have created or the, the, the silence created by the active invisibilization so these are the ones I've just talked about cultures, laws, institutions now I'll talk about what happens to the individuals and it starts from the physical the sort of cases that we see are very often are so physically debilitated by what was done to them that is all that they can do to get themselves off the bed in the morning and they're not going to go walking into a police station or finding a lawyer to defend them to take the case to court um, we, I mean some of the, the consequences of serious sexual violence are, are incredibly profound and they require months of medical in intervention to get a person back to the point where he can literally just walk and do basic physical tasks I mean one of the biggest signs of somebody who's a survivor is when they, they sit on the edge of a chair like this or when they say excuse me but I, I really don't feel comfortable sitting do you mind if I stand and you have a one hour discussion and the guy's standing there like this that's a, if you see that, you know you've got a problem, or he's got a problem. Psychological depression, sleeplessness, post traumatic stress disorders, suicidal ideation, all of these things are not the best way to get someone into a place where they want to talk about what happened and make an issue out of it. Psychosexual. What, what becomes clear, we haven't got time, but if you look at the sort of narratives, the testimonies that we're hearing, what you see is every single concept of self that a person has can get destroyed by these, these experiences. So if you are the man who has been forced to rape his own grandmother, you know, your sense of yourself as a, as a basically good, honorable human being is shattered your sense of your gender, your sense of your masculinity, your sexuality, your, your capacity to relate to those around you are all shattered. If you get time to watch that film, another film, not Gender Against Men, but one called They Slept With Me, if you listen carefully, you'll see all these three statements, you'll hear all of these three statements within the space of less than 10 minutes. They used us as women, so there's the gender, idea it's not natural for men there's a sexuality idea and you know once you've been raped you really no longer feel that you wish to be the head of the household which is you know like really the the kind of foundation stone of most in, of people's sense of their masculinity in many cultures <coughs> 
that's at the individual. Then you get to the psychosocial and the way in which the individual and the, the family, the individual and the community, they all conspire to keep things silent. If you are a member of a particular refugee community, for example, that is highly vulnerable, highly stigmatized, the last thing you want to do is to advertise that there are men in your community that have been raped and therefore to kind of reinforce the idea that your community, your ethnic group, whatever, is not up to defending itself. So the communities tend to really not want to hear these stories and they will tend to try and shut up those individuals who try to talk. Families, the same. And politically, what we see with a lot of individuals, and this is clearer in the cases we've worked in in northern Uganda than with the refugees coming from Congo and places, is that these were people who were raped in their own communities. They were never able to get away. They just stayed where they were. But they engaged in these kind of acts of passive resistance against the government. Because in their case, the rapes were committed by government soldiers. So from that day onwards, they just withdrew from those spaces in which they considered themselves to have been engaging in one way or another with government. In the, main, the main character in They Slept With Me was a government, he was on the government payroll as an agricultural advisor of some kind. He just resigned and went back to his land and he's been a subsistence farmer and <clears throat> ever since. There's another story of a guy who will not step onto a road because he sees that as a government space because government owns roads, right? And government has to maintain them and private individuals are not even allowed to maintain roads in Uganda. They are government, they're a government domain. And this particular guy, he literally spends hours every day standing right next to the road making a point. The other interesting thing about these, and again from a transitional justice and from a criminal justice point of view, is they do, when you look at these impacts, and they're not exactly, once you're aware of them, you can say, well, it's, you know, it's obvious this is going to happen. You have to wonder about the genocidal intent. Because remember, the definition of genocide is a part or all of a particular group. And when you look at the stories of the individuals, there are hardly any stories where if you ask the person, if you ask the victim right, what was being said at the same time as all of this was happening, they will nearly always tell you the story and in the story you'll get remarks made by the perpetrators alluding to their ethnicity or to their nationality. So you, get a, you start to get a very direct link to this idea of you know, we're attacking a particular group here. And of course, keeping the whole thing spinning, the whole wheel spinning, it's not just about, okay, so somebody's keeping quiet over here, the laws and the institutions make it difficult for them to speak. You know, so if we change the law, suddenly they'll be able to speak and the problem will go away. It is more complex than that, because you can see that in all of those myths and everything, Patriarchal assumptions are very present about men being strong and invulnerable and aggressive and blah, 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 and able to defend themselves and their families. All of which are, are challenged by the experience. You can see in the assumptions about men, you're kind of establishing a gender binary in which women are the opposite. You can see all the homophobia in all those male rape myths. And those, I think, are the three broad kind of idea frameworks that keep this thing moving, and which mean that you can't just adjust a couple of laws. You can't just bring in a couple of extra programs to work with male survivors in an institution that calls itself UN Women which says it's there to challenge patriarchy, but actually is reinforcing it in many respects. You have to look at those and really deconstruct the institutional frameworks much more profoundly. So it's not really an ad thing. You have to first deconstruct and then rebuild. <clears throat>
And you have to be really careful about what we do and what we don't hear. Last, a couple of weeks ago, I, I actually showed that film they slept with me to Pilar's class, the one you've just come from. And, you know, one of the students there spotted or heard, rather, a line that I had just never heard, I'd just never picked up. And it was, you know, where the, 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 the survivor telling his story talks about how the, the perpetrators told him, you know, we'll never allow you to spread your seed. And which goes back to the issue of genocidal intent, eliminating a particular or part of a group. But <coughs> that phrase, and I, haven't, I need to go back and actually get the exact wording, but I, I've watched that film I don't know how many times, and I just never heard it. I never heard it. It took somebody else coming at it with a different lens. She was actually from Guatemala. She picked up on it the first time she'd ever watched the film. So, you know, that also makes us wonder, like, how much do we have to hear before we hear? Turning now to the achievements, and this part is much shorter, but the um, in achievements in making conflict-related sexual violence against men visible and in breaking silence. So I said at the beginning there are two major challenges, invisibility and silence. Invisibility created by institutions and silence of the, the victims. One of the first steps that we took was to make a film, a film in 2009, which some of you have watched, Gender Against Men. Those of you who have watched it, you'll remember that we had a number of victims slash survivors on there, and you also remember that all of them were blurred. You didn't actually get to see their faces. You saw just enough to hopefully be persuaded that these were genuine genuine cases talking, right, to give that sense of the movement and but you couldn't make out who it was, I hope. That film led to an article uh, two years later actually, 2000, that was 2009, this was 2011 and that article continues to get referenced a lot and I still get emails every now and again from someone who says, oh we just saw this article and it's such an interesting thing and important area of work, can we discuss further? So even two year, three years down the line, that's having an impact. But that article came about because somebody in the UK had watched that film and persuaded a journalist to watch it, and he then wanted to come and do the photo essay. And that's the article where that, that first photo I showed you, where the guy had been raped with a screwdriver, it was around, it was, that photo was done as part of the, <coughs> the preparation for this article. The article in turn led Al Jazeera. I know, are you allowed to watch Al Jazeera in Canada? I know it. <laughs> but Al Jazeera, most of you I'm sure know Al Jazeera. It's, it's, it's somewhat different to CNN. But Al Jazeera have a program called Inside Story. They picked up on the article and then they put an inside story together, which involved literally just the journalist, myself, um, Lara Stemple, who's an academic based in California, and a representative from UNHCR. And it picked up on the article. It seriously embarrassed UNHCR because she didn't know what she was talking about, and she had nothing she could say. And, you know, and the person who was convening or chairing the discussion said, yeah, the UN doesn't come out of this looking very good, does it? So they were very embarrassed. They say they weren't, but I think they were. Then they slept with me. Um, and this one, if you've watched it, you'll, you'll have noticed that actually there's a big change from gender against men. And the big change is the way in which, partly in the way in which the stories are told, but also the fact that the people involved, particularly this guy, wanted to show his face. And if you're interested in gender, you should watch it again just thinking about the, what, is, what are the gender issues here and do we think about gender as just a binary or do we have differences, differentials within each, of, each half of that binary, let alone people who are outside the binary. So within the binary, I think it's important to look at 
kind of the age gender hierarchies. You have children, you have youth, adults, and elders as a minimum in most societies. This guy is very clearly an elder. And this is very interesting for transitional justice practitioners, or would be. He says, I can tell this story because if I don't, who will? Like a younger person cannot tell this story because the consequences would be so bad for him, so he just can't afford to. The other main person who talks is, you know, uh, when a mushroom is grown, it no longer fears the sun. Our time in this world is, you know, we've not got long left, actually, so we might as well tell this story. And they both kind of see themselves as doing a service to younger men in the community. And not just to men, but to their communities as a whole. So there's a very interesting nuancing of the gender binary, I think, that, that you see in this film. Then the BBC World Service came in and, <clears throat> and did another thing which, in a way, is quite conventional. You listen to it and it talks about sexual violence against women, starts with women, and you know, it's, it's, it's not that different from other programs you've probably listened to or watched. And then it does the same with men. And you know, if you're familiar with sexual violence against men issues, it's not that different from what you've already heard. But what was radical about that program was that it was a two-part program which gave equal weight to those two sides of that gender binary. So part one was about women victims, part two was about male victims. So just by its structure alone, it kind of radically challenged the prevailing myth that I put up at the beginning that you know, this is so insignificant that we don't even need to talk about it. And if we do, we're taking away from the much more important discussion about sexual and gender-based violence against women. So if, you, if you're interested, you should uh, listen. It's, it's a 30 minute, each part is about 30 minutes. And it is quite well done. So basically the films kind of both made the invisible visible, but particularly in terms of this one, I think they were about breaking silence. So that, that kind of also challenged institutions much more. This one was really about individual survivors breaking the silence at a very particular point in their personal history. They were breaking their silence more than 20 years after the events in question. So again, from a TJ perspective, that's a challenge. You know, if you, if you set up a, a TRC process like we had in um, East Timor or Sierra Leone, you know, they're always very time limited. And that time period, even if it comes 10 years after the conflict, may not be the right time period for the people concerned. So that needs to be borne in mind. The other thing we've done is to try and challenge or to create new materials. And we're just beginning this process, so I don't have many examples, but what they call IEC materials, information, education, communication. And we're trying to shift from this kind of thing. These are from Ruchuru, which is in Eastern Congo. It's one of the epicenters of sexual violence in Eastern Congo. <clears throat> so in Ruchuru, you'll find this World Division, I'm sorry, World Vision poster, and it's just one amongst many. This one is rather too graphic for everybody's taste. Um, but again, you can also see who the perpetrator is and who the victim is. So the previous one, it's very clear. This one is very clear. So what we've done is to try and create other materials that, that don't go with that set of assumptions. So this one, you can see now in that top left-hand corner, that's the little bit the picture I showed at the beginning, which then got invisibilized by the, all the different myths, just extracted from the top left-hand corner. And the artist is there trying to depict this, the reality, actually, that a lot of survivors sit, recall what happened, and think about killing themselves. So I, I actually think he's captured it quite well in that picture. Um, but yeah, we, we created this poster. Um, we also created this one to say, 
you know, there is a gender binary for most people, but then within that, there's all these different layers that I just talked about. And just to make it much more possible for people to say, well, actually, yeah, I, you know, actually I've got a kid who fits here, or my grandmother was raped, or whatever. Disabled people are even more vulnerable than average to, to sexual violence because they may have even more difficulties fighting off someone who's attacking them. And since we've had these posters, you know, and we distribute them, when people ask for copies, we give them copies, we get calls from all over the place, including from Ugandans. Because the reality is, that at the moment, there, is, there isn't any Ugandan organization dealing with male victims. So even those male victims are starting to call this number at times. The numbers. What we're trying to do is to create new sources of evidence. And the, the most, I think the biggest success we've had with that so far is through establishing systematic screening, uh, where we basically, we talk to everybody who comes to our office. So when they come and they say, you know, I need to see a lawyer or I need to see a counsellor, we then sit down and we take them through a whole series of standard questions. We ask everybody. We don't care whether you're male or female or other. We'll ask you these questions. And they do include some fairly direct questions. You know, have you ever had an experience of being touched in a way that you didn't want sexually or of being beaten in a way? Have you ever been forced to commit a sexual act that you didn't want to do? That kind of thing. And what comes out of that is that basically more than one third of the men who are coming to our offices have had an experience of sexual violence in their lifetime. And more than 10% have had it in the preceding 12 months. Now these figures are lower than for women. For women it's more like 60% of the women who come through our doors. So they don't destabilize the that sense that you know, it is more of an issue for women and girls than for men and boys, but they change the relative weighting. It's not 90% women, 1% men. It's, it's more like 60% of victims are women, or 65 and 35. At least in terms of people that are coming looking for assistance. It's not a population-based survey. It's a screening of people coming to an office looking for help as refugees but not necessarily for help about sexual violence experiences. At an international level, I mentioned already, we, we worked on generating this, what they call a need-to-know guidance note. It's number four. I think there are, in total at the moment, there are five. So there's other guidance notes. I'm working with LGBTI refugees, disabled refugees, I think children. I'm not sure what the other one is. That, that, by the way, that's the note that was put under diversity, right? That report makes a huge list of recommendations, 29 specific recommendations, but they're grouped under main headings around determining the scope, developing the right kind of responses, mainstreaming male inclusive understandings, and so on. If you want to see the report, it's online. Um, we've done some research into, you know, what, what are the legal avenues that are available. Given the kind of legal frameworks that I talked about, are there any legal avenues available? And uh, <coughs> the, what, you, what you end up, the conclusion we came to is that the only real avenue in most places is through the Rome Statute. So either the International Criminal Court itself or if the statute of the, the Rome Statute has been domesticated into your domestic law, but even when that has happened, I, need, I, I realized the other day, I need to check in Uganda, we domesticated the Rome Statute, but are these provisions really domesticated? But the good thing about the ICC is that it recognizes at least the gender binary. And if you read it, it's quite surprising. You know, some of the things they talk about when they talk about rape, there's a discussion about anal penetration even before a discussion about vaginal penetration. So that kind of took me by surprise the first time I read it. But they say 
gender refers to the two sexes, male and female. So they kind of conflate gender and sex immediately, which is problematic and which <coughs> arrived as a result of, I'm told, primarily certain Catholic dominated states and Muslim dominated states that did not want to get into a discussion about everybody who falls outside that gender binary. What the Rome Statute does, which had never happened before, is to kind of institutionalize a recognition of sexual violence as an element of crime against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. That was made possible by the work that was done by these two tribunals, ad hoc tribunals, so-called ad hoc tribunals. But it's now been built into that overarching framework. I'm just running, I'm sorry, I've gone on much longer than I expected. The, the development of new definitions of gender inclusive approaches. This is something that we wrote just a couple of weeks ago and submitted to the office of the prosecutor as a commentary on their draft policy. So if you had time to look at that, our commentary on their draft policy, you would have seen this. But this, this is probably the most interesting paragraph in that paper in the sense that it kind of makes a positive proposal for what a gender inclusive approach would look like but it's a proposal which actually fundamentally challenges the majority of thinking about gender-based violence and gender-based vulnerability because it says that all gender identities can be both sources of power and vulnerability and that is situationally determined so there will be spaces in which much though, you know, patriarchy and all the norms that I talked about make it a better deal for most people to be male than to be female in general, but in specific situations that may be re reversed. Not that it suddenly becomes brilliant to be a woman and terrible to be a man, but it just becomes terrible to be a man. So the situational aspect is really critical. If you're looking at investigations, we come back to the title, investigations, that you do not go into an investigation with a bunch of assumptions about the directions of gender power in a conflict. So if you look at, you know, like many of the men that we've worked with, for sure they were privileged by virtue of being male. And for sure, that's why they were targeted for sexual violence. So their privilege became their vulnerability. And you really have to look at that situation by situation to understand why <coughs> this particular form of violence is happening. Um, I think one of the other things that I hope is going to prove to have taken the debate further on than it was, was in that report that we wrote for the SRSG, we listed this long list of forms of sexual violence. I won't go through all of them, but if you actually sit and think about them for a few moments, each of, many of them attack gender, many of them attack gen sexuality, masculinity, in one way or another. And most of them are not involving the anus. Remember I said the myth of, anal rape, of sexual violence against men is that it's all about anal rape. It's not. That's a very important one. It's extremely damaging. But these, are, these can be just as horrible. And at the time that I prepared this for the SRSG, I, I hadn't really thought it through quite enough. But there's something around being forced into not just acts, but then a sense of a different sexuality. So you can have forced homosexual acts, which is bad enough in itself and can introduce all sorts of physical harms, but the mental harm is more around the damage it does to your sense of what your fundamental sexuality is, which, you know, wh whatever it is. So being forced into heterosexual acts that you don't want to do could be just as damaging to your sense of your sexuality as being forced into homosexual acts that you don't want to do. So it's interesting because I had a discussion last week. First time I presented this, I just said forced homosexuality, forced heterosexuality. And someone said, no, that's, that's the wrong language. 
And I really had to think, is it the act or is it the, the ality, the, the sexuality? And I think it's, that's why I put slash, you know, it could be both. But I think that the mental harm is more around that sense of your, your sexuality, your sense of who you are as a sexual being, being totally destabilized. In terms of what we're looking at now, we're looking at how we characterize these various forms. This question of how we should assess the mental harm. Uh, how to defend those men who were forced into sexual acts they had absolutely no wish to commit. And also, what are the intersections? And you'll have seen that, that paper, the one that somebody mentioned having read it, but you know, the paper about investigating with, with, with women in Rwanda and how all sorts of intersections of gender and ethnicity and sta uh, economic status, class, how all of that influenced the, the process of investigation. But it's also very much part of the acts that took place in the, that you're investigating. Like I said, I, none of the men that I've interviewed have said, well, not none, virtually none of the men I've interviewed have said, yeah, the guy just wanted to have a good shag. They nearly always say, you know, just before he penetrated me, he said, you deserve this because you're a Tutsi, or something along those lines. Or, you know, you are an enemy of the country, so you penetrate that guy because he's also an enemy of the country so you both deserve to be punished in this way so there's a very sexualized form of punishment going on but it's totally linked to these other identity issues so just by conclusion pivotal moment it's a very precarious moment um, and as I said, you know, if you really want to get to the, the social justice and the individual justice, you have to deconstruct these gender and sexuality norms and normativity. Otherwise, you're just not going to ask the right questions. So I'm going to end there. Thank you very much. <laughs>